Get Rich Education is brought to you by Norada Real Estate Investments and Mid South Home Buyers. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else, and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Hey, welcome to Get Rich Education, episode 62. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, and I'm back to help you build your wealth and make you more successful than me, faster than me. And today I'm with that rare person on the planet that can actually make taxes fun. That is Rich That Advisor, Tom Wheelwright. You know, learning how to legally reduce your taxes, you know, it basically has the same effect of you achieving a risk-free return And that's cash that you can reinvest right back into your business if you're a business owner, or you can immediately re-lever at five to one if you're a real estate investor. Tom and I are going to discuss how recent tax changes impact you since taxes are such a dynamic and changing field. We're going to get into specific actions on how you can avoid a tax audit, and you're going to learn exactly how to make your travel, meal, and entertainment expenses tax deductible. So here's Tom. Tom Wheelwright is the founder and force behind ProVision Wealth, the world's preeminent wealth and tax strategy firm. He is the author of the great book, Tax-Free Wealth, which I own, that went to number one on Amazon in the corporate category. Years ago, Robert Kiyosaki named Tom as his rich dad tax advisor. His firm is also my tax strategy firm, and his firm is my tax preparer. That's ProVision Wealth. Welcome back to Get Rich Education for your second appearance, Rich That Advisor, Tom Wheelwright. Hey, thanks for having me, Keith. It's always, always a pleasure. Tom, you know, I think people hate paying taxes more than anything else in the world, and you do a great job at saving them taxes. Maybe that's why you're so well-liked. And, you know, we really see in society that small tax incentives can create big behavioral changes. So you want to talk a little bit about the recent history of people paying taxes and, and not liking to do so and, and how you help them with that? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. So so interestingly enough, I, w- I was at a conference in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, last month, and the IRS uh, commissioner uh, spoke and actually said that uh, the, the U.S. It has the best tax compliance record in the world. So um, as much as we hate paying taxes, we're better at paying them than anybody else in the world. I was in Italy um, speaking um, a while back, and I always look at the tax law of where I'm going, right? Because tax laws are pretty similar from from country to country. And uh, in in Italy, they actually have two levels of tax evaders. Okay, now, in in other words, you can be – you can break the law a little bit or you can break the law a lot, and they have different penalties for how (laughs) much you break the law. So it's really interesting that, you know, uh, uh, we do hate paying taxes, which I think is actually why the tax law – you know, I've been known to say that the tax law is a series of incentives, and that's really all it is. And that's why, because people do hate paying taxes, and so a little bit of a tax incentive will encourage people to do something. And actually, they've proven that tax incentives have are more efficient. If you want to create policy, you want to enforce policy, tax incentives are actually more efficient than a direct subsidy um, or you know just refunding people money or something like that. Um, if you give them a tax break, it, and I think it's just because of, like you say, it's the emotion of paying taxes. People hate it. Yeah, it's like people want to avoid what they dislike even more than what they're incentivized by and, and drawn to. So it's it's kind of funny. And, you know, that's interesting to know that at least on a worldwide basis, the United States has some pretty good compliance because I think it was even Albert Einstein that said the most difficult thing to understand in this entire world is income taxes. Uh, it's, exactly. Actually, <laughs> I used his quote in my book. Uh, I, I love that quote. I love that quote. It makes me feel good about myself. So, <laughs> Well, one of the things that make it difficult to understand, besides it already being complex and being a really long tax code, is that there's also dynamic and there are a lot of changes from year to year. And if there's up on those changes, you can take advantage of those. So since I last had you on the show, Tom, about a year ago, what's what's happened in the world of taxes? Well, lots have happened. Of course, we have the uh, infamous Affordable Care Act. And of course, we all know that if, uh, if the government calls it something, it's the opposite. So they may call it the Affordable Care Act, but 
but I don't think anybody believes that. <laughs> and those provisions are starting to get fully implemented now, and, and even next year we're going to see even more implemented. So the, the big penalties for uh, noncompliance, interesting dynamics you're seeing. Uh, McDonald's, I don't know if you know this, but McDonald's is starting to put in kiosks, and the reason is, they say, is because of uh, minimum wage because minimum wages are going up so much in some yeah. some places, so they're putting a kiosk to get rid of workers. Well, the other reason they're doing it, frankly, is because, remember, McDonald's are independently owned. They're franchises. So uh, franchisees, they don't want to be subject to the Affordable Care Act, which, you know, this year it's 100 employees, next year it's 50. And so, you know, you want to avoid that. One way to do it is just have fewer employees. So that's, uh, that's an interesting development in the cause and effect that you're talking about. You know, the, the most recent change, I think, we've gotten a, a little bit of press. I'm actually doing a uh, radio show tomorrow specifically on this and um, did an interview with the Arizona Republic last week on this, is this change in the transportation bill. This is not a tax bill. This is the transportation bill that funds the, you know, the roads, basically. In the transportation bill, there were two tax changes, and this was signed into law just a week ago. The two changes, one is um, if you are a quote-unquote serious delinquent taxpayer, you can lose your passport. Wow. And and the second is is that they've decided to turn over taxes that are due that they that the IRS set, decides that they can't even, either they can't locate the address or they just decide it's not worth their time. They actually are required by law now to turn them over to an outside collection agency. So th- that, of course, is <laughs> is uh, a little problematic because it's not a great trend. We think um, the IRS is bad, and they are. I'll talk about a trend in IRS audits in in just a a minute, if you'll remind me, because I think it's a a really important trend to recognize. You know, we think the IRS is tough. I mean, just think about if if now your tax bill is out there with an outside collection agent that does not get paid unless they collect. So you think the IRS is hounding you. Wait till you get with an outside collector. Wow. The passport thing, though, I think is, um, you know, it's problematic just because when you think about a combination of things. First of all, the rule is that if you owe more than $50,000 and you're seriously delinquent, by serious delinquent, that means that they've sent you all their notices, okay? They've gone to lien status. You know, you are seriously delinquent. Now, for whatever reason, it could be that you had big medical bills. It could be that you have your child died. You know, you're going through a divorce. Whatever the reason, doesn't matter, okay? you're seriously delinquent, then what happens is is that the IRS then turns your name over to the State Department and they pull your passport. And I don't know what notification they're going to give you, if any, but I can just see you're, uh, you've been through this, this horrible divorce. You know, you, you've got, you, you found this great new spouse. You're going off on, on your honeymoon, and they stop you at the border saying, sorry, but your passport is uh, no good because you are seriously delinquent in your taxes. And here's what, Keith, here's, here's what I think makes it worse is that um, the IRS uh, actually, when I, again, when, at that national tax conference I was at, they admitted that they're only answering 40% of the calls that come in. It, that means that they're not even picking up the phone, <laughs> okay? So you think about this, you go, you're trying to get a deal done with the IRS, right? You're trying to get a deal done. You're calling and you're calling and you're calling. They're only picking up 40% of the time. So your chances of getting through, even if you're on all day, you know, you can, you can be on hold all day, are still only 40%, okay? So you can't get through. You can't get a deal done until so they pull your passport. So the good news, though, there is a solution to this, okay? Tax professionals like myself, we have our own number to the IRS, and while it it used to take five minutes to get through, now takes us an hour and a half, we can get through every time. So the answer to that one is, is that if you're delinquent in your taxes, and specifically if you owe that much money, be sure to you know get with a tax professional. That's that's a big one. But if, if we can, Keith, can we go back to the IRS audits just for a second? Yeah. What about the audits? So there's a trend. You're too young to remember George H. W. Bush, uh, George George Bush number one. He was uh, famous for two things, right? Read my lips, no new taxes, uh, which lost him the. Uh, the re-election. re-election, but he also was famous for saying that he wanted a kinder, gentler IRS. And to his credit, we did get one. 
IRS auditors were uh, the the culture of the IRS w got to be really good for a number of years as a result of that. I mean, it comes from the top, right? And and we really did. I mean, we had really good auditors. They were fair. They were looking at. They were trying to help with compliance, etc. That is no longer the case. Now the IRS, they almost feel like they have a mandate to collect money. So they are looking everywhere. You know, it used to be that if you looked like you were doing, you were reasonable in your documentation, that's fine. I have actually seen um, in the last year, I've seen two audits, uh, one colleague of mine, that the IRS auditor wanted a receipt for every single item deducted on the tax return. Okay. Think about that. So yeah. meals, your travel, think about, I mean, are they allowed to do that? They are. I mean, they, they're actually allowed to ask for receipts, but they just had not done that previously because they're looking at, okay, we're looking for compliance. And, and if, it, you know, if they're going, okay, I'm, I'm going to question these items over here. Okay. Your entertainment seems high. Okay. Show me, show me receipts for, you know, for this month of entertainment. And, you know, I'm going to do just a check here to make sure you're compliant and you do. And then all, all is good. Right. No, that's not what's happening. Now they're saying, okay, show me every receipt for the entire year. The other thing they're looking at is, is revenue. So they pull in your bank statements and they're saying, okay, so tell me you have deposits totaling 600000 but you've only reported $400,000 on your tax return. Right. So clearly you're underreported by 200000 Well, what a – no, I have multiple bank accounts and perhaps I transferred money in from another account. Okay, like nobody ever does that, right? Never heard of it. <laughs> so you, you have to prove it. You have to go down and prove it, and you have to match up. My, my point is is that, that it, it's come to the point and, – and the auditors are not nice. Uh, I'm, I, I've had um, – for a long time, I, I had not had an experience. When I first started back in the 80s, we had some nasty auditors, and I remember those. But then there went for a long time after uh, George H.W. that we actually had very reasonable auditors. We don't have reasonable auditors anymore. Um, I'm, I'm just finding that – more more than ever, it's important to manage the auditor more than it is to manage the audit. So you actually have to – what we do is we actually go in and say, look, I know you want all this information, but tell me what you're trying to accomplish here. And I'm going to actually get this together and help you do your audit because the, the goal is – the goal on an audit is not just to not have additional tax bill, but it's also to take less of your tax professional's time because remember, they're charging you an hourly rate for that. So you want to go in and you want to make sure that that, that audit is managed so that the auditor is not just out there fishing. And that's what they're doing right now. So it's a disappointing development. Having been in a conference where uh, twice now in the last uh, year and a half where the IRS, current IRS commissioner was speaking, it's not surprising because I think that's who he is. I think he's uh, a tough guy. He uh, actually came out of Fannie Mae. He was the one who went in to straighten out Fannie Mae, and he's come in to straighten out the IRS. Okay. I don't think there are very many words in the English vocabulary that strike fear into the heart of investors and citizens as the word audit. So what are some of the best things a person can do to avoid an audit in the first place? Uh, well, for, first is, is don't think that all tax preparation is created equal. You know, uh, I, I think there's thought that, well, I have to do my taxes. I don't want to do my taxes. I want to pay the least amount of money to do my taxes. That is a serious mistake right. because how, as you know, Keith, how you report an item on the tax return, I'll give you a simple example. Let's say that you went to a seminar to improve your business. Okay. So I go back so I go back to a seminar, right? I'm required to, to ha get 40 hours a year of professional continuing education. Okay. I go to a seminar. I have a choice. I can write on there. I can put seminar or I could put continuing education. If I put seminar, I guarantee that IRS hates seminars. Hmm. But continuing education, they get that. Uh -huh. So little things like that are things that, you know, how, how is your tax preparer reporting things? So that's avoiding the audit. And that's good, but we always we actually always assume, though we ha have a very low occurrence of audits, 
because of how we prepare tax returns, we assume every tax return is going to be audited. So the other thing that your tax preparer needs to do is have good documentation and actually respond to it. There was actually quite a bit of discussion. This is the American Institute of CPA's National Tax Conference that I w- was at, and there was quite a bit of discussion by the presenters about tax preparation and how poor uh, a lot of tax preparation is. Uh, they're not requiring the information that they need to from the clients, and, and that's something that actually made me feel very good because we do. Sometimes it feels like we go a little overboard, but what I saw at that conference was, well, but that's what you have to do, and it's not like it's, – it's not a commodity. It's not like going out and buying oranges. Okay, I mean, your tax your tax preparer is, should be your tax advisor, should be your tax consultant. They should be the one that is doing uh, is really minimizing your taxes and your chance of an audit. You know, when you have the 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 consulting meeting with them or your year in planning meeting with them, but when they're actually doing the tax return, so that's a big deal. And I, I think the other the other point on an audit, and and here's how. So I give you the. Number one rule for never being afraid of an audit. You, you ready for this, Keith? Okay. Okay. So everybody write this down. If you're in a car, pull over and stop because you're going to want to write this down. So here's the number one rule for never being worried about an IRS audit. And you just write this down. I will never speak to the IRS. <laughs> As a taxpayer, you should never, ever, ever talk to the IRS. Ever. Now, the IRS audits, they are – I'm seeing it every time now. They want to talk to the, to, to the taxpayer. When you get that notice in the mail saying it's going to be this in this white envelope from the Internal Revenue Service, and it says, we've decided to audit your tax return for, in this case, say 2013, the very first thing you're going to do is you're going to call us, you're going to call your tax advisor, and you're going to say, okay, got this notice, okay, and then you're going to fax it over or get it over to us. and then what we're going to do is get a power of attorney. And that power of attorney is for everything except the actual money. We're not going to sign off and and, and actually sign off on, on the refund, et cetera. We're going to make have you sign off on that. Right. But every other contact, we have the power of attorney. So the IRS can ask all day long for, I want to interview the client. I want to meet the client. No, I understand you want to do that. But I am the power of attorney. I am the power of attorney for all things. Okay, you have no right to talk to the taxpayer. I am the power of attorney. It's as if I'm the taxpayer now. Well, the the benefit of this, of course, is that you talk to the IRS. I guarantee it, you will screw it up. (laughs) Okay, well, I think for some of us, me included, that actually makes me more comfortable that I shouldn't be talking to the IRS because I don't really want to anyway. (laughs) Well, exactly. The other side of it is you're going to be very emotional about it when it's about us. It's you know, it's an emotional thing. You know, and the old the old saying is, uh, hi, the higher the emotion, the lower the intelligence, right? right? So I'm not going to be emotional about it. It's it's not me. It's not about me. I'm going to care about it from a professional standpoint, but I know how to handle an IRS auditor. I've been doing it for 35 years. So I know how to do that. I know how to go in and talk to them. I know how to manage that audit. And so you talking to the IRS is just Seriously, it's just going to mess things up. It's going to cause them to ask more questions where the other thing I can always do is I can always say, I don't know. Let me check with the taxpayer. Let me check with my client. And then I can come back and we can actually construct an answer that serves us. Uh, you know, we're telling the truth, but we want to construct it in such a way that, you know, that we're telling the IRS basically the way we want them to hear it. Yeah, the method of delivery can be pretty important. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is Rich Dad Advisor Tom Wheelwright. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Cash flow real estate investors nationwide and worldwide. This is Get Rich Education's Keith Weinhold. Forbes has rated Memphis, Tennessee as the number one cash flowing market in the world. Our good friends at Mid South Home Buyers have been Memphis's premier turnkey real estate provider for 14 years with a stellar reputation and an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Owner Terry Kerr was born and raised in Memphis. Yeah, he knows the market and has renovated and sold over 1,000 houses in the Memphis area. Find out what their many repeat buyers already know. Their houses are completely renovated even come with a one-year builder's warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're a perfect fit for the first-time out-of-state investor or the seasoned investor diversifying their portfolio. 
Mid-South Homebuyers Friendly Staff makes investing easy. Learn more at midsouthhomebuyers.com or give them a call at 901-217-HOME. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the U.S. Our simple, proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Get your free copy of the ultimate guide to passive real estate investing at noradarealestate.com slash guide. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com slash guide. This is Cashflow Diaries Jay Massey. Do the right thing, then do things right. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. So here we are near the end of 2015. So Tom, what are some of those sort of year end things that someone will make sure they want to do by December 31st in order to get the best and most favorable tax treatment for themselves? Well, uh, you know, first and foremost is if you have not done a tax strategy, I know you have Keith, but you know, a lot of people, they think of, of tax planning as, well, when I have a transaction, I'm going to call my tax advisor. Instead, a much better way to save taxes, actually mu- much more effective way, is to actually create a plan of action. You know, how am I going to save taxes all the time? Well, there are certain things that we can do at the end of the year. If they haven't been done yet, from a strategic standpoint, that ought to be done. For example, at the break about entities, you know, there are entities that can have huge tax benefits for you. It might be that we set up an entity, let's say you're a flipper, for example, you're, you're doing fix and flips. We'd like to be an S corporation. Well, let's say that we set ourselves up as an LC because we wanted the S protection, but we never made that S election. Well, guess what? We can do that. Even though we're late, even though we're supposed to do it within two and a half months of the beginning of the year, we can do that. We can go and, and, and make that change and elect to be an S corporation. And by doing that, we're going to eliminate a bunch of Social Security taxes. We might look at paying our children. You know, a lot of us have kids that come to work. You know, they, they help us. They, I mean, when I was a kid, right. my dad was a printer, and we were always sitting around the dining room table collating pages. I mean, seriously, we had this huge dining room table, and there's a bunch of us kids, and there's six of us, and we'd sit there, and we'd walk around the table and collate, and, and we did this over and over. My dad never paid us for that, but he maybe should have from a tax yeah. standpoint, okay? Yeah. Because think about this. I mean, as parents, you're in a much higher tax bracket than your child is, and it doesn't matter if your child's five, six, seven years old. If they're helping you and they're doing something you can pay them for, then pay them. So paying your children, let's say that you they've done this all throughout the year, you just never paid them. Now we have to document it. We have to make sure that it's a reasonable rate that we're paying them. My dad can have paid me $100 an hour to collate you know, papers, right. but we can pay a reasonable rate for it. Now might be the time if, if we have a business that we need some child models, we might take some pictures of our kids and pay them for modeling. Okay, so paying your kids at the end of the year, I think, is a, is a big opportunity. Another one that we have to pay attention to is the home office. So this is perhaps, I think, the deduction that is missed the most and for the worst reason possible. And the reason people miss the home office deduction more than ever is that their tax preparer told them don't do it. Yeah, that's kind of the old mantra. They're afraid that that's going to trigger an audit if you take the home office deduction. Oh, my heavens. Well, so the, actually, so let's say we've made our entity election so that we're, now we're an S corporation. Well, now the home office, the, the way we're going to do that is we're actually going to submit an expense reimbursement to our S corporation. Our S corporation is going to just reimburse us for it. In the S corporation, it's not even going to show up as a home office. It's just going to show up as office expense. Okay. So we're not even alerting the IRS. And this, by the way, this is the way the IRS requires us to do it. So we have to be reimbursed for it. So we're reimbursed. That reimbursement is not taxable to us because we're being reimbursed for an expense of the corporation. Uh. The corporation's paying the expense, and but it does have to pay it. So in the olden days, or if you were a sole proprietor, you actually report your home office on your tax return as, you know, home office deduction, you go through all, all that and you take it again, you know, on your Schedule C. But to be a Schedule C, by the way, is 
worst idea ever. First of all, you're five times more likely to be audited on a Schedule C. Second of all, you have no balance sheet, so you, there's no way for your your CPA to check whether you've done things right. So there's there's no check and balances there, and you're paying much higher Social Security taxes. So there, there's all sorts of problems with that. Don't do that. But the home office, we can go ahead and take it by getting reimbursed for it. Another thing we have to do is we have to, if, if we've got a, an automobile that we use for business, we probably don't use it 100% for business. So we need to do some things at year end. Uh, we may have to actually have to reimburse the company for the personal use. If the company's been paying for the car the whole year, now we have to reimburse the company there are all sorts of little things that we need to do at year end. This is why we do what's called year end planning. And of course, the other thing you want to do at year end is you want to get an idea of where do you stand. Because let me give you an example of why this is so important. Let's say that you, you know, you think I've had a pretty good year, and then you look at it, and it turns out you've had a bad year from a tax standpoint. In other words, your taxable income is really low. Well, it may be that you actually want to move some income from next year into this year. Because it will be taxed at a lower rate. Okay. I know that's backwards to how most people think. Most people think, well, I want to pay my mortgage on De- in December instead of January. I want to I want to accelerate deductions. Well, that's true if you're in a high bracket. But if you're in a, an especially low bracket this year, you may want to do the opposite. You may want to postpone expenses. You may want to accelerate income because what we want to do is we want to get to a lower tax bracket. That's always our goal is to get to a lower tax bracket because we get to a lower tax bracket – Guess what? We, I mean, we never have to pay that back, right? That's that's not a deferral. That's a permanent tax savings to get to a lower tax break. So anything we can do, paying our kids, accelerating income, it may be that next year we go, we're, we just look at next year and we go, I've got all of these expenses coming next year. You know, I'm going to have a low tax break next year. I had a really good year this year. I mean, like I have a colleague that's got a lot of clients that are political advisors. Well, in an election year, they have much higher income than in a non-election year. So this is a non-election year, so they've got low income. So next year, they're going to have really high income because the uh, election year. So maybe that in this low year, they want to accelerate income next year, whatever. So that's the type of thing. That's the reason you always want to sit down with your tax advisor at the end of the year. And it's, it's not too late. It's a, we're, we're getting towards the end here. But I would get on the phone with your tax advisor, get them to do a projection, see where you are, and then see what kind of planning opportunities there are. Yeah, this is a real advantage of a tax strategy. We don't just need to look at one individual year in one isolated capsule and then the next year the same way. And one of the things that helps us get some of those deductions, and I travel a lot, and something I'm asked about a fair bit and I rely on ProVision for my help with is how do I make my travel, meal, and entertainment expenses tax deductible. What are some of the best ways of going about doing that, Tom? Well, first of all, it's remembering what makes any expense deductible. So there are three requirements. It has to be um, have a business purpose. It has to be ordinary, meaning it's typical in your business, and it has to be necessary, meaning that purpose of it is to actually build your business and either the purpose is to increase your income or increase your market share or something like that. Okay, so remember that business purpose, ordinary and necessary. Well, when you think about travel, what does that mean? Well, the IRS is defining that mean that the primary purpose of the business trip must be business. So. What's primary purpose? Well, it means that I'm spending more time on business than I am on non-business, which means four and a half hours a day during the work week, right? So one of the things to do is make sure you're scheduled so that you do spend that time when you're traveling, you're actually spending on business. Now, for the meal side, once you're away from home and it's a business travel, your meals are deductible. So you, you now you get the meal expense. Although I, I would say that some people out there maybe don't spend a lot of money on meals. So here's a little tip. They can look at the per diem rates. Let's say that, uh, you know, we have people, we all know people, right? They're the millionaire next door, right? That uh, they go to McDonald's. They're in New York City and they go to McDonald's for breakfast. Right. E- even though they make millions of dollars. Well, guess what? Uh, the per diem rate is a flat rate determined by where you are. High expense like New York. I was in New York a week ago or so, and, and that has a higher per diem rate than the standard per diem rate. But per diem rate is just a flat deduction. So I just take that flat deduction, and it could be more than what I spend. So we ought to – I always think that people – unless you're you know, somebody that just you – know, you always eat nice places, that's always going to be higher than the per diem rate. But if you tend to 
be careful about how you spend your money, then you might want to look at, at taking the per diem deduction, which is a, the daily deduction, as opposed to taking the actual expense. Okay, I would imagine the per diem deduction would be somewhat easier to document as well. So as long as you can document that you've spent at least four and a half hours committed to a business purpose in a particular day, that's when you can make all the meal expenses for that day deductible? Right. And then if, you know, if your spouse is involved in the business, then, you know, take your spouse. If your kids are truly involved in the business where pigs are cute and hogs get slaughtered. So be a little careful. Don't deduct your kids if they're not truly involved. If they're truly involved, absolutely. But if, if you're just taking them along because, you, you know, they're learning about, you know, you want to take them to, to the mat or you want to, you know, you're going to go to a Broadway show or whatever. And, and you know, that's really part, that's the family part. Don't deduct them. Don't be greedy. So the other thing to remember, by the way, Keith, is make sure you document. So travel, meals, and entertainment, you have to document better um, with the exception of the per diem. You're right. Per diem is really easy to document. You just have to document that you were actually on a business trip. But the rest of it, you need to document why you were going, what you were doing when you were there. If it's a business trip that's combined with pleasure, then make sure that you keep a log of your hours and what you did. And take advantage because, I mean, you might as well deduct it. And that way the IRS is paying up to 40, 50% of your bill. Okay. So, for example, if I go on an eight-day trip to New York and half of those eight days I can document a legitimate business purpose, can I go ahead and take the travel expenses like the flight expenses and have half of the flight expense be tax deductible, for example? It's an all or nothing. If you're traveling in the U.S., it's all or nothing. So either it's primarily for business or it's not. So it's either all deductible or not deductible. So let's say that you're spending, you go, and then you travel, and let's say you spend three days on business, and then the next five days you spend personal. Is the primary purpose business? Mm, Mm -hmm. Probably not. But let's say you spend five days on business and three days on personal. I would say, yes, at that point, your primary purpose was business, it's just that for those three days, your lodging's not going to be deductible. Your meals and entertainment, your, your meals are not going to be deductible for those three days that you were not on business. On the other hand, let's say you fly out on Thursday for a Friday meeting. So you got a Friday business meeting. You got a Monday business meeting. And then you, you spend four and a half hours a day in business. And the afternoons after one o'clock, after you've had your business meeting, your, your business lunch or whatever you're in contact with, you and your family go off and, and sightsee. Well, you can do that every day, okay? And you can take the weekend off too. You just have to work four and a half hours during the weekday. And so if you plan this out, you can get an awful lot of family time together and make it deductible. All right. Well, that's a great way for my listeners to potentially plan things out when they go visit a turnkey real estate market across the country or wherever. And one way I document meals is um, whenever uh, our meal's done, I get the receipt. I just write at the top of the receipt that my wife and I discuss this and that particular detail about our real estate business. I use my phone app to take a photo of it and just go ahead and document it that way. There you go. And and I would highly recommend, by the way, that you, you take a picture or you scan all your receipts because they fade pretty quickly. Yeah. And there's so many uh, friendly apps. If you just uh, go ahead and check receipts apps on your phone, you can usually find something. Oh, and one thing with this, uh, Tom, does one need to have their, say, buy and hold real estate business incorporated as an LLC in order to get these deductions? Or can they do it as a sole proprietor? Not that that would be suggested necessarily, but must they have an LLC? The, the type of entity you have is not relevant to the deductions you get. It may be relevant to how likely you are to be audited. It may be relevant to your asset protection. But from a tax standpoint, it is not whether it's deductible with a few exceptions. Okay, Whether it's deductible is based on the expense rather than based on the entity. Yeah, Tom. Well, you know, as we're we're winding down here, you know, I've been a ProVision client for a few years, and um, you know, I guess typically when you bring on a new client, um, you know, typically you can find them a lot of tax savings. I mean, me personally, I see ProVision. I don't see it as a cost expense. You know, I just kind of see it as a cost savings because you find so many deductions for me. What are some of those typical things that you find for new tax strategy clients? And you also have a wealth strategy branch there. What are some of those savings that you find people either in taxes or in a wealth strategy where you help them out? Well, from from a tax standpoint, uh, you know, we always start with uh, low-hanging fruit, which typically is what entity are you using and uh, are you getting all your deductions? Okay. Those are the easy ones. Quick example in the home office, since we were talking about that, 
Uh, what people don't recognize usually is that the home office, by taking that deduction, you also increase your automobile expense deduction. And the reason is, is because the IRS treats your first trip of the day as a commute, non-deductible. It's personal. So let's say you go out and you look at houses first thing in the morning. That first house you look at, that's a commute unless you have a home office. Because if you have a home office, you've commuted to your home office 30 feet. And then that very first trip out to see a house or to see a property is deductible now. So most people will actually double their business automobile deduction simply by having a home office. And, and that's one that people miss all the time. From a wealth standpoint, the reason we got into wealth strategy is because when what we've learned over the years is that tax savings are impacted significantly by how you invest your money. And what we found was that people had no idea how to invest their money. So we were just kind of said, well, in order for us to give you good tax advice, we better have the wealth strategy set up. You know, I would say the key to, to, to wealth, and the first thing we, we do is we get people to focus. If you're in real estate, don't also be in stocks. I would say, in fact, if you're in single family homes, don't be in apartments. If you're going to go out and buy three two houses, I would not go out and buy four two houses. If you're buying two hundred thousand dollar houses, I wouldn't go out and buy a five hundred thousand dollar house. What we found is, you know, there's a, an old adage: a niche will make you rich, right? And so you want to be really focused. You look at the wealthy people in the world: Donald Trump, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. They made their money doing one thing. They didn't make their money diversifying. There's no money to make diversifying, and it doesn't actually, in most cases, doesn't even help your risk. It actually increases your risk in most cases to diversify because you don't have control anymore. So if you, what, what we want every client to do is we want to narrow their focus, and our job is actually to help them do that. And once they narrow their focus, then they know what they're investing. Uh, what we say is that the difference between an a professional investor and an amateur investor is an amateur investor makes a new decision every time they invest and a professional investor makes a decision once and applies that decision over and over and over again. And so when you get that narrow and that focus, that's how you get good at something and that's how you don't make mistakes and you make a lot of money. Yeah, that's a great broad-based takeaway. Successful people change their mind slowly. The less successful people change their mind an awful lot. Yep, that's true. Well, then any last takeaways for the Get Rich Education listeners, Tom? The last thing I would say is remember that every dollar that you bring in is either taxable or not taxable. Every dollar you spend is either deductible or not deductible. So every day you are making decisions that have a tax consequence. When you think about probably the most famous commercial in the world is, you know, 15 minutes and you say 15%. Right. The Geico commercial, right? And yet, if you're getting a deduction for taxes, you're probably saving 30 to 40% every time you spend money. So why not let the government contribute? The government wants to contribute. It's in the law. It's there on purpose. They want you to do this, okay? So why not, you know, just take a little time. Take the time like you did to, to develop a strategy, a plan of action. You know, have a, a tax advisor that actually looks at taxes as favorable, not, not, not a penalty because they are. The tax laws are very favorable to you. If you're a business owner, if you're a business owner, you're an active investor, the tax laws are there to help you reduce your taxes. 99.9% .9 of the tax law is an instruction guide to reducing your taxes. So if you can get 40% simply by spending uh, you know, some time with the tax advisor, you get a 40% off on everything you spend. Why wouldn't you do that? So, well, well, Tom, if any of my Get Rich Education listeners want to engage ProVision in case they have more questions, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, just uh, go to ProVisionWealth.com and uh, just uh, click the, right up on the top right-hand corner. There's a free consultation button. Just click in that, and uh, we'll get you on the line, and we'll you know, get some idea of how or if you know, we can help you. I'd be happy to do that. Great, Tom. Well, thanks so much for coming back for the second time on the Get Rich Education for providing value to the listeners. Very happy to do so, Keith, anytime. Well, more invaluable and actionable stuff from Rich Dad Advisor Tom Wheel right there. And hey, if you want to hear more from Tom, he first appeared here on Get Rich Education episode 19. And on that show, Tom and I spent more time discussing real estate specific tax advantages. Well, next week for the holiday edition of the show, I'm going to get personal for a couple minutes and tell you what I'm grateful for this time of year 
And then you're going to hear me interviewed on my own show, kind of, where an interviewer asks me some questions I did not see beforehand, and he interviews me, and I give the answers on my own show rather than me being the one asking the questions for a change, okay? So, all right, well, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be connected to some of the best finance, investing, and real estate experts in the world, and I'm here with a new show every Friday to help you build your wealth in specific and actionable ways so that you never miss a free show. The best thing for you to do is use the subscribe button, the subscribe option on your podcatcher by subscribing. You're delivered every show. Until next week, whatever you do, don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to visit iTunes and leave your comments. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively.